Euh, Ludo, tout est bon Ok. Is everyone uh, great? Let's let's get started. Okay. Uh, hello, hello everyone. Um, before everything, a few few disclaimer. Um, this is a talk about an uh, embedded system. Um, IoT, the, the thing without screen that you forget in your basement for two years because it's the kind of monitoring your electrical consumption or something. Um, it's not that the, the pattern that will be described here won't be valid in other use cases, but it's just that the rationale are not necessarily the same. So we can argue from one, one way or the, of another in the, the few things that we follow. You can do it uh, elsewhere, not necessarily a, gr a good idea. Um, since this evening, uh, general team uh, revolve ar around Python, we will do it in Python. Um, you can do that basically in any language that you want. You need a, a big, uh, big standard lib, but uh, I know for a fact that there are people in this room that are planning to do that in a JS, for example. I don't know if it's a good idea, but... Uh, and most of the code uh, presented here uh, is a simplification because um, there are limits of, of the code you can fit in a slide. Uh, so everything is on, uh, on GitHub, uh, right there. Uh, you, you can follow the talk uh, with the source uh, before you if you want. All right, so as I said, uh, we are going to talk about a subset of embedded system. Not all embedded are created the same. Some of thing have a touch screen uh, in your fridge or stuff like that. That's not what we are going to talk about. We're, it's really about uh, stuff that you don't really touch. You place it somewhere and you forget it. Um, when you have this kind of system, you usually need to, to choose some existing framework. Uh, when you have computational power, I'm not talking about microcontroller thing. Uh, for example, a Raspberry Pi, uh, you usually go with a distribution like uh, Raspbian or you go with the Android stack or stuff like that. And all of this stack were conceived with what one big fundamental idea, it's the user that, in, that, in that, that is in control. Um, for example, you have, uh, you have this stack, you, you see the, the, the thing, here, I just a, a way for the user to, to take decision, control the hardware. You have this very big stack uh, with some kernel driver managing your uh, power consumption, for example. And then you have uh, some kind of uh, user space daemon interacting with that driver. And then you have some kind of uh, messaging system. And then you have a graphical uh, UI when the user can say, OK, I would like to uh, power it down or not. Um, in IoT, we need an autonomous system. Uh, the, the system D stack, for example, or the, the Windows stack or Andros, uh, and Android stack, um, can't really be used in a modular way. You, you can't take some part of it and expect it to work very well. So we usually choose one, put in there, and it's not pretty when you mix them up. Uh, so so you, you end up kind of simulating the user, uh, connecting to, uh, to, to, to the part of the stack, um, and manipulate the, the device like that. It's, us it's usually complex. Um, for example, the, the, the idea of, uh, of System Day is to, to, to boot it uh, qu as quickly as possible, so we try to parallelize a lot of things. Uh, in the embedded world, it's uh, making things difficult because it's difficult to debug and reliability is kind of paramount. So uh, you end up uh, generally coding your service file uh, depending on one another so you can sequence the, the, the whole thing. And, uh, and ba basically, a, a little bash script starting everything in the right order is way simpler. Uh, and you can, you, you can control the timing between the, the each step by adding a, sim a simple sleep. Um, so what I would like to, to show you here is a do-it-yourself kind of stack. Uh, tailored for your need, 
and I would like to argue that uh, it's less work, it's simpler, and uh, it's more robust than start it for, from a standard stack and mutate it to fit your requirements. Uh, in autonomous system, the general architecture is kind of, I have some inputs, uh, I need to uh, process them, I need to take decision and uh, take action that has impact on the outside world. Uh, most of the time you end up also, uh, also streaming data because a lot of IoT systems are complex sensors. Uh, the, the key point is by itself. So the, the system should be aware of its state. Uh, where I am, what's, uh, where I am in my computing sequence, and um, what should I do next? Uh, so you have a lot of states. So you end up thinking about the main dimension of your system. For example, if you have, uh, you want to do a device that you put in your cars to monitor something, uh, uh, you should check if the engine is running, uh, if the car is moving, something like that, and then you say, okay, it's 20 minutes since the. Uh, the engine is, uh, is down and the car is not moving, so probably I should power it down. Uh, so the next stage should be shut, you, uh, shut yourself up, uh, shut yourself down, sorry. Uh, so how can you manage the state? One, one way is simply considering that you are in one state and dealing, uh, dealing slash ignoring the error that it generates. For example, if you have a battery in your device, uh, you can take the hypothesis that it's always functional and always have power and sometimes it makes sense if you have nearly constant power supply and the battery is just there to, uh, to, uh, to, to do the exceptional case. So you just ignore the, the, the case when there is a battery issue and when there is no power you just crash and the next time you boot you try to recover from, uh, for, from the, the crash but most of the time it's not, it's not sufficient. So the, the first thing when you think about autonomous system, you, you should start with enumerating the, the different state before you, you start coding anything. Uh, see what transition you should have. And, uh, and for example, seeing that when the Wi-Fi is not available, you should not run DHCP. Uh, instead of having DHCP running all the time and when the Wi-Fi is not available, throwing errors. Uh, if you do that, you end up with a more reliable system. Here we are talking about uh, system state, not the application inside of it, so because the application inside of it usually has other state, but I'm most mostly focusing on uh, of system Wi-Fi network, uh, what process to launch, uh, uh, if I should uh, power it down, stuff like that. Uh, so obviously you end up doing uh, filtering on your, uh, on your inputs. Uh, you need probably a big complex event processor to do the, the, the big stuff. Uh, I won't talk about that. This, this is very interesting. The <laughs> yes, it's very, very, very interesting, but uh, I want to take this time to talk about the, the platform stuff in detail. Uh, how you should run your application, how to boot, how to shut down, how to manage logs and stuff like that. Um, most of the, uh, the, the, the code, uh, as I said, is on GitHub, but I also um, uh, put the code in a uh, in, uh, build root, uh, build root uh, layout. So a build root is a build system to generate Linux firmware. Uh, so I forked the build root uh, repository this afternoon for the, the Raspberry Pi if you want to try it. Uh, you just uh, clone it, try, tap, type mail, make, it's pre-configured, it will generate uh, a firmware, you can play with it. Uh, and for this talk, I'm going to use uh, an example to, to, to talk about the different steps. Uh, and I'm presenting to you some kind of Wi-Fi scanner. So basically, you can have your Raspberry Pi, just plug a GPS in that. Uh, you work with it in your, in your car and other stuff. It will log every uh, wi new Wi-Fi that it sees with a GPS position and you can send it to whatever you want. So the, fir the, the first thing for the system is to boot. Uh, in any Linux computer, uh, the first thing to boot is the bootloader. In embedded stuff, it's mainly U-boot. Raspberry Pi is not like that, but uh, most of the time you have U-boot, you can have Grub, 
this program, the, 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 the responsibility of this program is to load the, the kernel and maybe the init, uh, init from uh, FS and call it. Uh, the, the kernel then initializes the machine, initializes itself, and then call the user space. The, the user space is conceptual space where the user program runs by opposition to the kernel space where the scheduler, memory management, um, kernel driver ex uh, execute themselves. Um, this program that the, the, the kernel call just after it's, uh, it's, uh, it's initialized will be our, our entry point. Uh, the kernel can know what, what to call with several ways. You can pass it in, uh, in command line, so you can call, uh, grab call your kernel with an argument, and, uh, and one of these arguments are init, uh, init equals something, and then you just give it the path, the, the path of the program that you want the kernel to run. Uh, you can do this uh, on your own computer, for example, you can really call, uh, when your desktop boot, uh, call with init equal bin bash, and you end up with bash and not, you, you don't see the, the usual boot sequence and, uh, and stuff like that. Also, when you compile the kernel, you can hard code uh, which program to, to call after the, the, the boot there. Uh, usually, the boot sequence uh, mounts some partition and mounts some uh, virtual device and virtual file system also. Scan for device, load the right module and firmware, and do some other uh, setups in, uh, in embedded world. You, you may want to uh, bring up it, uh, Ethernet or stuff like that immediately for debugging purposes. Uh, the, so, so the first step, you, you need to have some kind of file system. In modern Linux, in, uh, in, in modern Linux the, the, the file system are quite complex. If you type, uh, type mount in any given time, you see a lot of them. Uh, most of the time, you have uh, one real partition, the, the root FS, a mount on slash. Uh, in embedded, uh, in embedded system, you should really have a root, uh, root partition that it's only read only, uh, because you don't really want to uh, edit that. And probably you need to store data, so you can mount uh, a partition in read write to slash var. It's a usual pattern. Uh, you need a partition for the, the PROC file system, the PROC virtual file system. Uh, you mounted uh, on, on slash PROC. Uh, you can have a, a virtual file system for the slash dev containing all the device on three points. Everything that you see there represent, uh, represent a kernel driver. You can open it, do read write on them, and basically you are talking directly to the hardware. Uh, you also need some, uh, something called uh, the PT, uh, PTS file system. It's the pseudo-terminal uh, system that I won't go into the, the, that detail. You, you have also uh, slash sys. Uh, slash sys uh, is a file system that's representing directly kernel objects. Also, you, you might, uh, might want to, do, to, to, to have that. And uh, TMPFS, it's a file system only in RAM that can, uh, you, you can use that in a, as a general purpose uh, file systems, except that it won't write anything to the, uh, to, to the disk, only in a space in, in RAM. Uh, most of the time you, you use that for the slash TMP and the slash run where some program will store the uh, PID file or uh, lock and stuff like that. Oh, in Python, uh, how do you do that? The, unfortunately, the Python stdlib don't wrap the mount function. Uh, so, uh, so you need to go with the, the uh, libc. You can use uh, the, the C type module for that. It's, uh, it's a module in Python that can open any C la shared library and call any function in that. Uh, so we can use a standard C library and call the mount function. And then by, you have your Python mount uh, tooling and code. Maybe a good idea to check for error. <laughs> uh, and then you simply mount everything that you want. Uh, if you want more, uh, more partition data or different scheme and stuff like that, you just edit the code. You, you, don't have you, you don't need to, uh, to do configuration file. You can use simply uh, well, whatever you want. 
Um, after that, we will talk about the loading module. You should load your module. Uh, you can you can use mod, uh, you, you can use mod probe for that. You have uh, in Python a, a, a function called system that call other programs. So you load you load your module, and you have your low level setup. You have a file system correctly uh, correctly set up. You have some module running, and you can you can do everything uh, else. If you want to split your uh, your your init files, uh, you need to know that uh, the process that the the, the 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 program that the system calls first will be PID one. Uh, it's a special PID. It can die. We will talk about that later. But if you want to split the boot sequence in several parts and chain them to the, uh, to, uh, together, you can't use system or fork at the end of the first part to, to, to switch to the second part, for example, uh, you, you can't use that. You, you need to use uh, EXE. If you use EXE, you basically switch the current uh, program with a new one, and, uh, and the PID stay the same. Because you are PID1, you can't die, so you need to switch between the program and not fork a new one and then let the parent die or stuff like that. All right, another uh, role of init is to read zombie. Obviously, we have an OS, so we can launch, launch program. Uh, init launch itself to process, themselves launching to process, and stuff, uh, and stuff like that. So there, there is a POSIX rule that says when the subprocess finish, uh, its parent should get back its return code. Uh, if the parent can't or is blocked or uh, bugged and stuff like that, and he, he don't get back the, 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 the status code or the return code of the, the child process, uh, the child process stay in a state called a zombie. Uh, after a time, it consumes resources. The file, file descriptor are not always, uh, always closed at uh, the right time and stuff like that. So uh, after a time, when the parent also dies, the, the, the grandparent should rip the, the, the child and if nobody does it, it's pit one that does the rest. Uh, uh, when that happens, um, pit one gets uh, get the, the responsibility to, to, to reap everything. And how does it work? It's kind of easy. When you should reap a, a process child, the, the kernel sends the parent a, a signal called sick child. Uh, a signal is some kind of software interrupt. Uh, you jump from what you are doing to a signal in blur that you register earlier. Um, in this example, uh, in the main somewhere, you register you, uh, your, your handler. And when a child is, uh, <laughs> when a child should be ripped, the, the kernel just called the, the rip, rip process there. And then you use a syscall called wetpid and basically you rip the, you rip the program. Sometimes it will fail. For example, if you use sys the, the, the system command in Python, uh, the system will correctly wait for the for the subprocess, so there is no need for reaping. But the kernel sends the sick child anyway, so the reap process will be called, but it's not needed. So you will have an exception uh, for wetpid, and you should always use the uh, no hang uh, flag uh, because uh, wetpid. If you don't use that, wetpid will be blocking, and it's a bad thing your init will be, will be blocked until there is something to rip. So we, we have a correct file system. Everything is maintained in the right place. We, uh, uh, we can rip the, the process that we already launched. Uh, some modules are loaded, no what? So we probably need to launch apps. Uh, so you have basically in Python three possibilities. Uh, you can use system, the command that we talked uh, earlier. Uh, it takes uh, the, the program names and launch it. Uh, the problem is that it's a blocking call. So when the program runs, the parent doesn't and just wait for the child to finish its job. Uh, so you can run several things parallel. So that's not a good thing. Uh, you have the pop uh, the, the pop uh, library uh, subprocess in, in the subprocess library. It's launching the process, but, uh, but doesn't wait for the process to finish. You just launch it. And also, the API of Popen is quite nice. You can uh, set the input, output. Uh, you can communicate with the process, polling it uh, to, to see if it's finished or not, stuff like that. 
Um, and if the API of uh, Popen doesn't suit you, you need, you can rewrite it <laughs> your own Popen with a combination of fork and exec. Uh, but that won't be covered here. So let's write a process manager with Popen. Uh, first, we encapsulate the Popen object in another one that we will do it ourselves. Uh, to manage the case, the, for example, if the process doesn't start. Um, also, the, the, the main goal of, the, of a process supervisor I in IoT is to restart the process when they crash. So we are adding a check method. Uh, if the process is, uh, is dead, just restart it. Uh, and then you might see, obviously, a flow, in, uh, a flow here. If the process uh, crashes immediately after boot, it's restarted in, uh, in, uh, uh, in loop. It will consume a lot of resources. You probably should implement something kind of a backoff. A backoff is basically you take the time when you start the process. Uh, you count the seconds till it's dead. And if it's too short, you wait a little bit before restarting it. Uh, probably you should count the number of restarts also, and etc. and cetera. You should maybe add a, stat, a statistic method on this object to know what's the state of the, of the child, to know how many times you restarted it, and stuff like that. Um, this stat method can return some kind of dictionary, probably, containing the metrics. Um, most, uh, so some of these things can make sense uh, to, to your uh, use case, other doesn't. Maybe you need other things, maybe launching several child of the same process in parallel. Um, in any case, the, for example, the backup feature, uh, it's very simple in Python. You, you just get the time when you start, uh, get, get the time when you check if the, if the process is dead, okay, computing the delta and wait or relaunch if you want. It's just a few lines of code. The, 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 the last object was just for one process. The, your system, you won't probably want to, uh, to launch a collection of, uh, of process. So you probably need another object that have a collection of, uh, of, this, uh, of this object. So here is a supervisor object uh, with a method for start a process, uh, stop a process, stop all process, whatever. Uh, maybe it makes sense for your use case to have a, a signal method in there to send a specific signal to a specific child based on its name. Uh, again, very easy, very easy to do. There is actually on the on, on the source code. Um, so you you have you have kind of supervisor system. You can start with a nice Python API. You can start a process, check them uh, w when you need, and uh, and uh, the the system kind of work. Uh, we are in the boot sequence, so you have a file system, we have module, we, have, we, we can start out, so let's start application. You, you want to connect to your IoT device, for example, so probably you need SSH. Uh, maybe you want to, uh, to, to connect directly, so you, you may need your IoT device on a VPN network. Let's start a VPN, uh, let's start a VPN client. Um, don't forget to start some kind of system logging module, syslog, for example, or carlog. Carlog is a kernel, uh, kernel logger. And you want to start your specific business app. For example, in our case, you want to start uh, s something that we scan the Wi-Fi. Uh, wi and so you have some kind of, uh, of code like this. You create a supervisor object in the variable SV and then start uh, all, all your process. Uh, again and again, people talk about modularity. So you need to separate stuff, break down complex things into simple things. So if we want to scan Wi-Fi, we, uh, we probably want to generate uh, a stream of Wi-Fi information about at one time. So we have a, a, a Wi-Fi scan, just check the, 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 the Wi-Fi status every like five seconds, see if there is new Wi-Fi detected, and if there is, just send a, an event, hey, I have got a new Wi-Fi. Uh, you probably want a program that just listen to, uh, to, to your GPS, uh, GPS chip and uh, most of the time this chip talk in a language called uh, NMEA183. Uh, generally on a serial device, so you just open the, the, the device with Pi serial, parse the outputs, and then uh, generate a position stream. 
In, uh, in the source code on the repository, it's a fake GPS because I don't know the specific uh, of your setup. So it just generate a position trim fixed on this building. And probably there should be a program that kind of merge the, these two stream and associate the last position with the, uh, the, the last Wi-Fi detected or something like that. Uh, which brings us to another decision to take, how oh, everything communicate together. So uh, you have the problem of inter-process communication. On, on a Linux system, the, the most basic primitive available is the POSIX, uh, POSIX uh, communication system. So you have FIFO, uh, you have Signal, you have shared memory, uh, you have POSIX message queue, you, have, uh, you, you can write to the file system, you can work something directly uh, by file. Um, unfortunately, these API are quite rough. Uh, you don't get a lot with it. Uh, for example, knowing the current state of a socket <laughs> is kind of a tricky question at uh, any given time. So maybe we should look around and see what the Python library has to offer us. Uh, they are basically built on the POSIX stuff. Uh, so the API are a little more uh, Pythonic, but they don't provide much, uh, m m much more feature. Uh, and if they fail for some reason, usually you end up with a deadlock and everything is blocked instead of crashing. And crashing is actually better because if they crash, you can restart it and try to recover. If it's blocking, you need to detect that you have blocked. It's not, uh, it's not easy. And you have also another alternative you, uh, is that uh, using big, big third party system like uh, uh, some kind of database or uh, Redis and stuff like that. Uh, basically, this, uh, it's taking building block of a server software stack uh, and break down to uh, an IoT system, so what could possibly go wrong? Uh, when you have to choose, usually you discard everything that doesn't fit your requirements, and you end up with several possibilities. No, you, you need to select the best fit. Um, is usually, the, the main dimension to consider is the simplicity of the API. Uh, the, the, the more your API is simple, the, more the, the, the faster you go, the, 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 the more you can, you can add testing. The, the richness of your API is important too. For example, if you need a queue, knowing how many elements is in the queue is a really nice feature. You can't have that on, uh, on, uh, on FIFO, stuff like that. Um, is, is the queue can grow? Uh, or should, uh, should it be a little, uh, very little FIFO stuff like that? And another dimension is to take into account is how easy to test it. Python is really easy to test, uh, but if you are dependent of a uh, hard system to test, uh, it kind of destroys that capability, so that's not nice. So why not Redis? So for those who don't know, Redis is a NoSQL uh, database which provides a way to manipulate list, dict, uh, set, and string in a general key space. Uh, it's kind of a lightweight system, very performant. Uh, with a list, you can easily implement a queue, push to the right, for example, and then uh, pop to a pump from the left, uh, and it's basically a FIFO. Uh, so you have your init system on the top, supervising all these applications. System up to the right, specific application in the middle, communication, uh, communicating between them with some Redis queue in, the, in this example. Uh, Redis support transactions, so if you need the queue to, to increment a counter and push an element to the queue, you can, uh, etc. Okay, so the Internet of Internet of Things, usually, uh, this is another topic, you need network. So we need some kind of specific application to monitor the network. Uh, uh, you should definitely use a state model to know what, uh, what to start, what to stop, what route to, uh, to, to, to route your, pack, uh, your packets to, and stuff like that. Uh, for that, the Python standard lib is unfortunately lacking of the right API. But fortunately, there is a very good lib called uh, pyroot2, uh, uh, which, uh, we, uh, with which you can uh, control all the low-level network stuff. And so you just need to concentrate on the high-level business logic. Um, also, for the, for the streaming of the data, you have uh, access to a lot of libra library, like request if you want to push it to HTTP, or uh, if you want to stream things, for 
from a message oriented kind of architecture. You can use a PAO for MQTT or a PICA for MQP and stuff like that, depending on what your server needs. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's very specific to, to what kind of setup you have, uh, you have, so not much to say about that. But uh, what I can say uh, about it, it's in the end, something will fail. So you need to understand what, uh, what happened. Uh, again, Python has a nice logging module. You can define the, the logging module in settings, for, for example, and import that file everywhere. So you have the, the same settings for everything. Uh, with the Python module, you can easily store your log in uh, varlog, for example, rotating them with a rotating file, uh, file handler and stuff like that. Um, there is a bit of a catch. If you use, uh, for example, a settings module that you import everywhere, uh, you need to configure your logger uh, after the file system is correctly constructed because when you import a logger, uh, it will try to open the file and stuff like that. If you haven't logged uh, Munt, you, uh, you have a slash var, for example, it will crash. Uh, also, you should really, really, really log the, uh, the, the system metrics. You should log the CPU load, you should log your memory usage at a given time and sending to, uh, to the server, but you should not try to send your log directly. For example, if you, uh, if you know Sentry, uh, and you see, ah, it's a good idea to stream, <laughs> to, to stream the log directly from the device to Sentry, um, it can be, uh, it, it in, in some cases, it's not a good idea because if you have a network issue, uh, which uh, is generating log, you basically generate log that uh, uh, make your network issue worse. So you have a positive feedback loop and in the end, everything crash again. Uh, what you can do, for example, is to break that feedback loop by counting the error, sending the, the error count in, uh, with, a, with a periodic metric and stuff like that, and if you see that counter increasing, you connect to the device and uh, retrieve your log. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a strategy. Okay. If you connect to the device, uh, you usually use, 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 use SSH. Uh, and SSH, after the logging, usually spawn bash or ISH or, or any shell you want. But it can spawn Python too. Uh, you can connect directly to a Python console if you want. Uh, there are two things you, you need to do. It is redefine the default shell in the ATC password file, and you need to authorize the Python tree executable as a valid shell, which is usually not by default. Uh, if you have a collection in, uh, of API on your device, uh, you can import that uh, the, 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 this API. You can uh, ask. Uh, oh, the next slide, sorry. Uh, for example, you can uh, just import the, the, the stat process from, uh, from, from your supervisor, uh, supervisor and just uh, call it and you know everything, uh, how everything uh, runs. Uh, since it's a valid Python structure, you can easily uh, manipulate that uh, for loop, uh, sleep, one second, and printing some stats, and you have an easier, easier way to debug than to use watch and, uh, and PS and stuff like that. So we have, we, we have a, a system that it's booted, run the application. At one point, you need to shut it down. Um, the way it works uh, usually is the, the alt command or the reboot command or the shutdown uh, command in a, in a desktop system uh, send a signal to, to init and then init act on it. Uh, the signal to to, to, to do a alt is sig term. And to ask init to reboot the machine, it's sig user one. Uh, init needs some kind of teardown script. Uh, basically, stop all the apps in a good order because you probably don't want to shut everything down. Maybe you want to shut your applications, uh, application uh, apps down first and then send some kind of last message or stuff like that saying I'm shutting down and then stopping your system app. Um, when everything is shut, uh, shut, shut off, you should sync your file system. Uh, basically writing everything that is stored buffer directly to the, to, to the file system. And then you have a syscall to actually alt or reboot the board. Um, again, 
Uh, Python doesn't offer a uh, wrapper around the sync syscall or reboot or alt syscall, so just open the C library avec, uh, with C type and call everything. The, 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 alt, uh, the, the alt syscall and the reboot syscall are actually the same. It's called reboot. Uh, and they have some magic number for if you want to alt or reboot. Okay, what about, uh, wh what about device? Uh, <laughs> if you need UDEV, probably that your architecture of IoT stuff is wrong. Uh, if you have, for example, speculative uh, extension, maybe uh, some part of, the, of the, the device that you're shutting down for power saving or stuff like that, uh, you actually can declare everything uh, from the start and the kernel won't simply use the, the, the thing uh, if they are not there. That's, n uh, that's not a problem. If you really, 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 if you really need to do it, you can implement it by listening to U event. It's a uh, um, uh, Netlink, uh, Netlink socket name. Uh, you open it and the kernel bro broadcasts to every listener to U event uh, some kind of message, stru uh, stru uh, structured message. Uh, with information of what device just get connected, what, uh, what are these vendor ID, uh, process, uh, uh, product ID, uh, what class of thing it's, it's in, a lot of information. Uh, UDEV usually have that, act on it with the UDEV rules and bring the, bring the device up. So you just need to consume all this packet with a Python script. If you recognize your, uh, your, uh, your the device that should appear, just act on it, ignore the rest. Also, if you don't want to use your event, because uh, Netlink is, uh, is not a great API, uh, and you want to use other things, there is another way. Um, there is a, a file, a virtual file in the proc file system. You, you, you can just uh, encode uh, uh, a program name in, in that file and the kernel will launch that program every time the uh, uh, plug event is, uh, is arriving and this program will receive information via argument and environmental uh, variable and stuff like that. Hmm? Okay, one of the <laughs> other thing with speed one, uh, if speed one exits, the kernel panic not a nice thing. In any case, uh, in other process, there are no kernel panic, but uh, error are still annoying, so you should test. Uh, test your, your, your device. So, of course, during development, you should do unit testing. Uh, but since there is several modules interacting in, um, in, in ways, uh, unit test can't really help up to a, uh, up to a point, so you need at one point you need full integration testing. So there is this, this program called QMU system, and then usually it's a system IRM if you are on IRM and stuff like that. Uh, but you need to have a good description of the machine you are trying to emulate, and it's very slow. So for testing, it's it's for the worst case. You should use it, but not in uh, n not in most uh, most most uh, most of the time. There is some kind of uh, of middle ground between the two. You can use QMU, but only for the user space uh, program. It will still use the host kernel. Uh, you shoot in your uh, in your image. You use unshared that uh, program uh, to separate namespace or process uh, process ID space and stuff like that. It's basically con uh, container technology. Uh, you can use the, the this tutorial to uh, reprogram Docker from uh, from scratch yourself, and, uh, and and use that to test your uh, your RIT, uh, image. Uh, it's quite fast, so that's a nice thing. Uh, but you don't have access to the, the right hardware, so you need to mock everything. A few pointers, if you want to mock Wi-Fi, there is a kernel module called uh, this, one, uh, this thing that can do hardware simulation. You can have virtual Wi-Fi uh, wi inter, uh, interface uh, pop up and you just use WPS replicant on that, for example. 
uh, if you uh, if you have to mock serial, for example, because you have uh, the, the GPS chip uh, talking uh, over uh, over serial uh, serial device, uh, you can use pseudo, uh, pseudo terminal. Uh, if you have to interact with uh, slash sys, you can easily use pfuse, making a mock file system, just uh, the, the read and the write, uh, uh, implementing the open read and write uh, uh, syscall and uh, outputting some kind of default value. Uh, if you, you need to mock slash dev, and especially the IOCTL call, um, there is no easy way. Some uh, some parting stuff. Um, the 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 main problem with, with that is you can do everything in Python easily, but it's not necessarily a good idea. Uh, you, you really when you, when you want to do IoT, you really need to be pragmatic. Uh, a little bit of Bash is largely superior to a full-blown program in Python. Uh, Sometimes you simply don't need that feature that you want. For example, in the supervisor, uh, you would see I redirected some input because it's uh, really necessary, but uh, I didn't do the output. So basically, it's al uh, always printing on the uh, on the uh, on the console. Uh, maybe it's not needed. Maybe you just use your uh, syslog uh, module and not using your uh, Python logging module for everything. Maybe you just just uh, use it to. Uh, some specific application. And in any case, uh, the program's trace is your best friend. The one last thing. You're probably thinking in this talk, whoa, this guy recorded a lot of things, uh, reinventing the wheel and stuff like that. Um, all this uh, fake uh, Wi-Fi logger is, is online. You will see it's less than 1,000 line, uh, line of code. It basically replace most of the thing from boot to alt, uh, running application, doing stuff. Uh, obviously, it's not everything because it's leveraging uh, libraries. Tens of thousands of lines of code with, uh, with a little bit of glue. Wha what I presented is the little bit of glue. Uh, the main shift is the, is the switch from a bash-based uh, bash system uh, using big stack uh, like uh, system D and all its ecosystem to a Python based kind of system uh, using the standard uh, standard and other library to do most of the stuff. All right, in summary, uh, the, the, the key point of, of this talk was uh, in IoT, you should really model your system with finite state machine. Don't consider that you have only one state and if that fails, we don't care. Uh, you can write your own init and supervisor in Python. It's quite easy. The results are usually simpler and easier to debug for specific purpose system. I'm not talking about general desktop system. If you if you want to re, uh, reuse that system for other projects, uh, you probably want to generalize it at some point. But if you want to do it only once and make it evolve with the product, it's usually a, a, a nice a nice way. Uh, you should really evaluate the possibility of using high-level system uh, sis a system to, uh, to handle the IPC instead of POSIX primitive. And container technology and emulation is great to test embedded system. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. Uh, it's done. <laughs>